Hello, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Besma Mamani, professor at the University of Waterloo and, and director of the uh, Defense and Security Foresight Group. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome you all to this event uh, being sponsored by uh, Defense and Security Foresight Group with some amazing other organizations, including Women in International Security Canada, uh, North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network, Center for Social Innovation and Community Engagement in Military Affairs. Um, this is a webinar on the impact of intersectionality in research and policy making. Uh, the first webinar of our week long series looking at GBA plus and intersectionality in various research settings. So if you haven't registered for some of the other events, please uh, do look us up. Uh, we are uh, very much taking on the conversation about how to apply. Uh, so many things that you're going to hear today. Uh, let me begin uh, being at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that much of our work uh, takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Ashinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, uh, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within our Indigenous Initiatives Office at the University of Waterloo. So thank you all again. Just some quick housekeeping rules. Um, we do have a Q&A feature uh, to the bottom. Uh, please ask your questions throughout the webinar. Uh, you're going to hear a fascinating set of, of ideas and conversation, and we uh, very much want to include your contributions to it all. Uh, but let me begin first by just saying I uh, want to welcome Ambassador Jackie O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Jackie. It is a real treat and pleasure to have you. Uh, for those who don't know Jackie, although uh, she is so familiar to so many of us uh, because of the great work that she does, but uh, Jackie is the first ambassador for Women, Peace and Security um, appointed by Prime Minister Trudeau, and we're really, really, really proud. Uh, Jackie is uh, no stranger to academia, including having a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, Jackie has worked uh, through many different uh, avenues and, and, if you will, international organizations working on, on peace and security. Uh, her work has taken her uh, to about 30 different countries in working of establishing the field of women, peace and security and its application in government, security forces and multilateral organizations. And uh, I first had the pleasure of meeting Jackie when she was president of the Institute for Inclusive Security, uh, where she worked to directly support coalitions of women leaders in Colombia, South Sudan, uh, Sudan, Pakistan, and beyond. And through this work, uh, she advocated for meaningful inclusion of women in peace negotiations. And I really love that word meaningful because we're all too fed up with being tokens. And uh, there's a lot of work, uh, real substantive work for women to do in this space. Uh, she also helped found the, Rome the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative to eliminate the use of children during conflict. And uh, Ambassador O'Neill was also a policy advisor to Canada's Secretary of State for the Asia Pacific reason region. Uh, most recently, she was a global fellow at Woodrow Wilson Center's Canada Institute, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, and a member of the board of directors of the Canada International Council. Thank you so much, Jackie. Before uh, we give the floor to Jackie, allow me to introduce my colleague, uh, Maya Eichler. Maya Eichler is our lead in Defense and Security Foresight Group on uh, the Gender Plus, Gender GBA Plus. Um, uh, initiative that we've undertaken throughout the DSFG. Uh, Maya is an associate professor in political and Canadian studies and women's studies at MSFU. She holds the Canada Research Chair in Social Innovation and Community Engagement and leads the Center for Social Innovation and Community Engagement and Military Affairs at Mount St. Allison. Uh, Dr. Eichler is also interested in social change and citizen engagement in the military and security sphere. Uh, she's worked on, uh, you know, not only gender, but sexual violence and the armed forces. Obviously, a very, very topical subject today. Uh, she's a PhD from York University and has held many postdoctoral fellows at uh, USC, Harvard Kennedy School, and U of T. And her publications are uh, world renowned in this field and really, really proud and happy to have uh, Maya join us. So uh, I turn the floor to you, uh, Maya. Um, uh, sorry, I should say to, to Jackie, and, and then Maya will uh, begin the conversation. Jackie. Thanks, Besma. I'd be very happy to have Maya deliver remarks on my behalf. It would be the, the smartest I could ever sound, I think, if, uh, if those remarks went out under my name. Uh, so thanks for that introduction and uh, bonjour, bonjour mes uh, tous et toutes, and greetings from Ottawa, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. 
I am especially grateful to the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network, the Center for Social Innovation and Community Engagement in Military Affairs, and of course, WISE Canada. And really look forward to working with all of you. I, I sometimes forget that um, WISE uh, in the USA actually had a really formative role in my career. Way back in 2005, I did a week-long summer program with them, and it, opened my eyes to so much and definitely put me on a path towards much more of this work. And I still retain literally dozens of the relationships that I, I formed through that. So uh, it's really a, a very useful organization. And of course, BESMA, and it's, it's just no exaggeration to say that I learn from you every single week. Uh, even if you haven't published something that week, I'm usually researching something else and I come across something you've written or a, a interview you've done that gives me a great insight. So. Whenever you ask me to do something, I say yes, uh, almost without a question. Alors, je vais parler pour la plupart en anglais, mais si vous voulez poser vos questions en français, soit en français ou en anglais, c'est uh, pas de problème, et je vais répondre soit en anglais ou en français. So let's talk about GBA+. Plus. It is truly, and I'm not being sarcastic here, one of my favorite topics to talk about. I have previously called it uh, one of Canada's greatest national treasures, and I really do mean that. Uh, I know I'm not delusional. I know we have to improve a lot of things and keep working on it, but I think it is a really powerful tool. And you know, the, the core of it is this basic idea, or should be a basic idea, that different policies and practices affect different people differently. Um, and then adding on, as you have in this session, the, the concept of in intersectionality, of course, first coined by uh, Amer African American lawyer and, and scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. You know, one person can have several parts of their identity that we can't isolate from the other parts when trying to understand how they experience the world. And uh, when I talk about GBA Plus, I always tell, remind people we've been doing this as a government to varying degrees, of course. For about 25 years, so it's not new. It's not a fad. It's not a you know a of the moment kind of thing. Um, it's something that has been people have been trying to build up for for many years. Of course, it's not consistent in its application, and we have to do much better at it. But it's not a brand new idea. I also see this moment that we're in right now, 2021, as a time for GBA Plus to shine. Uh, you know, we have the pandemic and we are hearing in particular as Canadians, we hear a lot about the pandemic exacerbating inequalities. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't remember the last time I opened a paper and saw, as I have done recently, the term disaggregated data on the front page of our major newspapers. This is different. It's a bit new. You know, we're talking about hotspots. People say, well, what makes a vaccine hotspot a hotspot? Well, we know it in part because of disaggregated data. And even when it comes to, you know, addressing vaccine hesitancy, we're looking at disaggregated data, some of it by gender, some of it by other factors. So we're living and working with it. Some people are increasingly naming it. And I think there's a real chance to, to you, to, you know, to pick up on some of what's going on right now and keep building on it. Um, especially looking ahead to the economic recovery as we talk about intersectionality and uh, I was in a session the other, or a little while ago, and, and a piece had just come out in on CNN talking about, um, I think the headline said, the US economy lost 140,000 jobs in December. All of them were held by women. And you dig further in that, and it's quite, so first of all, that is quite stunning, but you dig further, black women and Latina women were hit disproportionately, and white women actually made significant gains in terms of new jobs. So unless we applied concepts of intersectionality to understanding that data, you'd have a completely misguided, I think, takeaway from those headlines. So all to say policymakers and people who had not been necessarily talking about desegregated data and understanding policy through that lens are increasingly looking at it. We also have a focus on racial justice, which is greater than it has been before. And on this week in particular, today itself is the anniversary of George Floyd's murder by a US police officer. Uh, you know, when think back to a year ago this week, a year ago this month, um, many Canadians, uh, Canadians of color, racialized people, quite frankly, had to waste quite a lot of their time even making the case that racism exists in Canada too, using disaggregated data, you having to explain how policies and practices in institutions have 
created or perpetuated these equalities. So far too much time has been, and I'm sure will continue to be spent trying to even make the case that racism exists. Many leaders, certainly not all, are acknowledging that our institutions have systemic racism. We suffer from them, we perpetuate it. And I think the basis of really doing something about that lies to a large degree in GBA plus analysis. So really understanding the way that different groups affect and are affected by our policies and, and practices and, and programs. So doing GBA plus is not the answer, but it's a part of the answer. And I think that gives us a chance uh, as we see so many for example, you know, federal departments trying to address systemic racism, uh, that gives a chance to really systematize GBA+. And I've been speaking a fair amount, obviously, given as, as so many of you have on um, with security institutions lately about the challenges and the issues that are surfacing uh, in a much more public way in the Department of National Defense and Canadian Armed Forces and others, and talking about GBA+. And, Something that's really been striking to me, and I, I'm sure many of you have kind of thought in this way before, but um, I've been kind of processing that, especially in security and defense institutions, GBA plus is a bit of a unique case to make the importance of it because the institutions themselves tend to pride themselves on treating everyone equally. And it's not a, it's actually a form of dishonoring someone to treat them differently. So the, the value or the ethos of the organization is in some ways predicated on, it's your level that defines your treatment and everyone within that will be treated the same way. And that is the definition of fairness. And of course we know that that, you know, different treatment provides or relates to different outcomes. Um, and we know that that doesn't hold true, but sort of introducing that concept is something that I've been processing more and more is in some ways much more of just an intellectual shift, but a, a shift in the way that some people perceive the core values of their institution. Uh, and Maya has done so much great work indicating and laying out with enormous clarity how that just simply is, is a false uh, assumption. Um, but I think that recognizing that it's actually counter to what some people think is fairness because of the way they've been inculcated in their organization is important. So to give us uh, time for questions and discussions, I thought I'd make just, just a mere five points about GBA plus uh, to share before we go to a discussion point. And these are based on uh, some of the observations over the last couple of years, as well as before that. Um, so the first one is, is an encouragement for us to continually, for us to not think of GBA plus as a binary outcome. So I hear people constantly talking about the GBA plus analysis was done or it was not done, or someone is trained on GBA plus or they are not trained on GBA plus. And I think we need to have a lot more scope and space for talking about the quality of that training of whether the, the analysis was done well or not. Did they look at one aspect of GBA plus and maybe do that well, but not the others? Was it on a certain component? So I, I see a lot of binary conversation, either or, done, not done, advocate, not advocate, GBA plus was included or not included. And I think uh, as a community, if we think about GBA plus being something that flows throughout a process, but very specifically, and I think this is probably much of the reason for the seminar series or webinar series that you're doing. There's so much scope to improve the doing of it, the understanding of it, the application of it. And I, I hope we can continue to go there. This should be, uh, the second one should be something that I think is obvious, but it can't be stated enough, which is that we have to integrate GBA plus earlier and earlier in our planning cycle. And wherever I've seen this kind of go wrong, it usually stems from being too surface and too late in the process. Um, quick example here, uh, many of you know Lisa Vandehei at, uh, at D&D, and she talks about how, um, and I'll just kind of reverse this for you a little bit. She talks about how some of the, the um, candidates, some of the officers who were in pilot training school, a little while ago, they discovered they were trying to gain weight very quickly. So like protein shakes, all kinds of other forms of gaining 20, 30 pounds in a series of a few months. Dig further, well, why is that? Well, it's because the ejection seats in fighter jets have a minimum load capacity of 140 pounds. 
So you have to be 140 pounds to be a pilot because otherwise you might not be heavy enough to get properly ejected from the seat. While many women were recruited into the pilot stream uh, and you know, encouraged to become pilots, trained several years, but not actually told that um, piece of information beforehand. So could we have applied GBA plus on recruitment practices? Absolutely. Back it up even further, can we apply GBA plus on procurement practices of fighter jets? Absolutely. That's something that Lisa and her team are now looking at. Can we change the design specs? Is that, is that a required design to have this minimum weight capacity? which disqualifies somewhere around 70 to 80% of women, but like 10 to 20% of men. So we're cutting people out inadvertently having a gender um, impact on it. But if we dialed it back earlier and earlier in the process, that would be important. And, you know, I see a lot of instances where people say, <clears throat> you know, we, we're gonna do on a, a GBA plus on a planned building. So we're applying it to infrastructure. And that's important because then we can see, you know, does the facility have, uh, is it accessible for people with disabilities? Are there prayer rooms? Are there washrooms that, um, that all genders can access, et cetera? But are we also using GBA plus to tell us if the location of that building is accessible and, and does it have a differential impact? Is it available and accessible by public transportation, which is disproportionately used by women and by women of color? You know, are the most marginalized clients uh, going more likely or less likely to access the building based on where it's located? Should it even be built in the first place or is there a different use of funds? So backing up, backing up the GBA plus. Third point, of course, the plus is not negligible. And, you know, I really understand that no one wants to be the plus or some people perceive it as sort of the et cetera type of function. And I think we as, as advocates and, and all of you as researchers uh, have a re responsibility to not treat it as such. And so, you know, the concept of intersectionality means uh, that we're not only looking at gender, we're looking at age and gender and ethnicity and age and gender and ability and ethnicity and age and gender and sexual orientation and ability and ethnicity and age and gender. These points all together, we can't just say we've looked at uh, whether this affects the LGBTQ2A plus or 2S plus community and, uh, you know, people by age. We have to keep looking at these intersections. We can't limit it to certainly not to binary understandings of gender. The fourth uh, point about GBA plus, and this is something that I think um, either people do intuitively and well, or we do terribly, and I'm on the terrible side of it which is embracing the understanding of storytelling as it relates to GBA plus. And, you know, we all know that unfortunately we still need to kind of sell GBA plus or market it or pitch it to people, it's important. And I certainly found that doing it well means having a lot of anecdotes and little vignettes. And so when I hear them, I collect them like precious jewels, you know, the, the fighter pilot uh, example, I have, you know, 52 other ones that I, literally write down whenever I can. I hear them at remarks people give in meetings. I follow up with them after meetings to make sure I get the core facts right. Uh, but really being able to just share like a paragraph long description of the difference that doing a GBA plus med. And I know that because academics in particular are so thorough and rigorous and honest, uh, you often don't like to boil things into short or digestible points. And I'd really urge you to help us um, by pushing yourselves to do it, you know, not uh, not overlooking the key points, but having these just basic examples and in particular ones that are not always about gender or if they are about gender, about ways that you learn something about men. I can also try to share those. I mean, we can talk more in, in Q&A if we want, but just having this collection of points that you, you know, you customize to different audiences is, is one of the most important ways that we can, I think, perpetuate this. And then the last thing, the, the fifth thing I'd say is that uh, in, in particular to our colleagues in government or related institutions, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that the GBA plus is just the analysis. We still need policies and direction, you know, to give direction on what to do with the findings. And I often hear a conflation, you know, I was doing women, peace and security because we did a gender based analysis plus. Um, or I was, I work on gender, uh, I did a GBA plus. And I think we need to make sure that we have clarity and directions that 
what we do as a government, for example, has to be anti-racist. We can't just understand the differential impacts on different communities. We have to reduce gender inequality. Our goal can't be we're not we're just we're not just not going to make it worse, for example. So the policy frameworks matter, and I think we need to make sure that we are viewing GBA Plus as the tool that gives us information. But what we do with that information as policymakers, for example, who receive uh, the information and, and the data still matters enormously. So maybe I'll end uh, there for now. Very happy to take questions. Would love reactions, input, feedback, especially from those folks who are either starting off on this or doing have been doing this for a while and uh, have, uh, I don't want to say war stories to share on it, but I know we've got a lot of different experiences on it. So I'll end it there and uh, thank you again so much for the chance to, to make these points. I want to begin with a warm welcome um, to everyone and a warm thank you to Ambassador O'Neill for her opening remarks. Uh, my name is Maya Eichler. I'm joining you from Halifax today, which is built on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. So my role within the Defense and Security Foresight Group is as the lead of the GBA Plus team. And I want to just tell you a little bit about our team and how it fits into the structure of the DSFG before we go to questions for Jackie. Uh, and I encourage all participants to start adding questions to the Q&A. So the DSFG is really unique in that uh, it has structurally integrated GBA Plus into the network. We have five regional teams and we have a GBA Plus team that supports um, the integration of GBA Plus throughout all network activities. In a sense, you know, this is an experiment on how to gender mainstream uh, defense research in Canada. So we are learning from our experiences. Um, you know, I think there's some interesting lessons learned about the possibilities and limitations of the work we've done. Uh, we've developed a whole bunch of resources uh, like the GBA Plus toolkit that will be shared with all the participants today. We have been doing uh, GBA Plus applications of all the working papers. Um, and so the, the goal is to bring out GBA Plus expertise to the network as a whole, but really also to build broader capacity for GBA Plus. So, uh, Jackie, your comments really resonated with, with a lot of um, the work we're trying to do within, within the GBA Plus team. And um, while we wait for some, um, some questions, I want to begin by asking you about the relationship uh, between GBA plus and intersectionality and some of the tensions there. Um, because, you know, G uh, intersectionality was really conceived as um, in a structural way, you know, it was really about structural inequalities and the intersections between marginalization experienced on the basis of race and gender and uh, other other forms of oppression. And often today we see the application of GBA plus that's very much focused on individual identity factors. And you kind of spoke about that in your last point that GBA plus analysis is not enough. Uh, we need defense policy that is, uh, you know, that is anti-racist and that promotes gender equality. So can you talk a little bit about, about that, how to go beyond individual identity groups to a structural integration of intersectionality in defense policy? trying to learn how to do every day. Um, you know, for example, within uh, global affairs, we now have a few working groups looking at how can we ensure our approaches to promoting women, peace and security are anti-racist, right? So we are not looking at, as you said, the specific identity factors of individuals or individuals in a certain area in a program, but what are ways that we are perpetuating advertently or in, hopefully inadvertently um, inequalities. And a lot of that conversation comes back to power, which is, I think, a way of um, taking it a bit out of, you know, I, individual identity characteristics, but looking at power dynamics and power relationships. And, you know, something that we, we've, we work up against often is that um, 
and I, I want to frame this correctly because I don't, I, it could come out very wrong. Uh, we're always focused on, you know, the concept of do no harm, which we should be, right? We, which we very much should always be doing. However, I think we haven't assessed enough how much um, any intervention is affecting power dynamics in a community. And just because we're not measuring the power dynamics that result from perpetuating you know, existing um, power dynamics when it, within a community by going to the people who are in formal positions of power or who have already established a, a current dominance in the region in some way. Sometimes we view those as having being like a net neutral in terms of affecting power dynamics. So I think part of what GBA plus can do is help us understand, you know, Power is not part of the plus, but power has to be the, the circle that everything is, is seen within. And to me, that, that's what helps us get a little bit beyond the individual characteristics, but to look at the more systemic changes. So a bit of a, a vague answer there, I'll just say it's a, like a super complex issue. And we have to be critically thinking about this in every single aspect of our, our policies and in our approaches, you know, just all the way from are we making our and I know we are not, our, our, the way that people receive funding from global affairs, for example, like who are we privileging and who are we, uh, you know, excluding because of processes, not just the goals that we have. And I, I see all of that coming together to deal with the more systemic issues and the systemic aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I look forward Thanks, to all Jeff. that you will tell us from your research on how to do it better, because I, I think we're quite clear that we all need to do better at it. I don't see any questions in the Q&A, and I'm not sure whether that's um, just me. Um, Jackie, do you see any any Q&A questions? I don't. I just see a chat. Okay. I don't see the Q&A, and this is probably a user error on my part. So yeah. So yeah. please put your questions in the Q&A, and not in the chat. Um, there is. Okay, there is a question. Oops. I don't see the full question, but it's basically on how to temper expectations and ensure there is long term support for GBA plus in the defense community. Do you want to comment on that, Jackie? How to temper expectations? I've never been very good at um how to ensure there's long-term support i mean the idea the way that i try to approach every single thing that we're doing is to make it uh as little dependent on any one person or any one internal champion as possible right so uh the idea is that we could have a change of government we could have a change of minister we could have a change of director in any one office and the practice of undertaking gba plus will be sustained and i think um, that's, that's how we do it. We build it in as much to, uh, longer term initiatives, longer term projects, and we build it into the training that the, the basic training that people get either inside of the, the cap or outside. And so if we actually are regularizing these conversations, this in training, this in evaluation, um, you know, one of the things I try to promote as much as possible is not asking the question in a meeting related to a specific project or initiative, did we do the GBA plus, but what did we learn from a GBA plus and what have we adapted based on what we learned? So if we have more conversations where more and more people feel, you know, feel even if they don't feel confident in it, they feel like they can speak to one point and that point went fine and they're gonna speak to more and more because as we all know, I think gender can be, gender and issues related to gender right now uh, everything related to, to race and racial dynamics and exclusion can feel very loaded uh, for people. And some people, unfortunately, want to avoid the conversation as a result. So I think the more we, we normalize having the conversation and give people the, the tools to have the conversation, the more it's going to be part and parcel of expectations. So that's how we, I think, manage expectations long term. And again, why I emphasize we've been doing it for 25 years. We built it into a budget process. You can't get money from the Treasury Board unless you have done a gender based analysis plot. Again, quality varies, but you have to do it. So tying it to things like money, tying it to career advancement, uh, tying an ability to actually um, articulate it to people's professional development. These are things that I think are going to make it stick longer term. And I don't see this as something that is going to be quickly or easily dropped 
uh, by any future government because it hasn't been uh, over many years. Great, maybe as a final question and in the spirit of uh, storytelling, I wonder whether you can give us an example of, um, you know, from your own work, uh, whether as WPS ambassador or your earlier work, um, you know, an example of where you, where GBA plus um, helped you understand a conflict situation better, or, you know, an example of how you tried to integrate GBA plus and you um, encountered um, maybe resistance or, you know, sure. there was a real opportunity, any sort of story that you, you might want to share from your own work. Okay, I'll give you a, a quick one that comes to mind that is often um, that I'll often share with. Well, there are so so many, and again, maybe someday I'll like my contribution to the universe will just to be to collect a book of book of these that I can put out um, that you all can fact check, <laughs> make sure are actually accurate. But the gist of it is okay. So um, this one is when I talk. Um, I try to share sometimes because it involved Canadian Armed Forces, it involves disaster relief and response, um, and involves a few other elements. So we all know that the Canadian Armed Forces is often engaged in domestic uh, emergency responses, right? So several years ago, uh, they were involved in setting up uh, support related to floods in Quebec. And one of the things they did was set up centers with you know key supplies, fresh water, for example. And some of the ways that they planned it was uh, distributing it in an equidistant way with thin points in neighborhoods. So basically geographic space between the different centers was the primary planning tool. Then GBA plus became a little bit more of a thing. Some of the um, folks who were working on these domestic response teams had undergone GBA plus training and they decided to apply it uh, for the next round. So floods in Gatineau several years ago applied GBA plus. So one of the things that they did was they started to identify people in houses that they were going to. So identifying where there were elderly people, concentrations of people with disabilities or mobility issues, pregnant women, more. And that changed where they set up some relief and supply center. So situating some of them closest to the areas that had the highest concentration where people had the most trouble traveling, putting them further apart where there were uh, people who were much more mobile. Uh, even in some of the worst hit areas where they were calling on people to evacuate, you know, to save their own lives, present, prevent the need for dangerous um, rescues. Because of GBA+, Plus, they were also able to identify that the people that were least likely to comply with calls to evacuate were men in their 30s and 40s. So what did they do? They'd send other men in their 30s and 40s to talk to them, convince them it was important, et cetera. This is an example I like because it increased efficiency. It wasn't about saying, you know, women are more peaceful or women do this and this. It was a, a pure, you know, real example of the plus and it increased the efficiency of the operation that they were doing. So that's just a short one. And that goes in so many, so many other cases. Um, I'm tempted to keep going, but I'll stop <laughs> so we can hear our presenters and, and talk further. But um, yeah, we have lots of examples of where it's been applied. The difference hasn't been revolutionary, but it's enough to certainly warrant the effort. Thanks so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jackie. And you're staying with us, so there'll be more opportunity uh, for you to uh, to tell us tell us some more anecdotes of how GBA Plus has worked. Um, we're going to now go to our panelists. Uh, we have three panelists. They are all members of the GBA plus team of the DSFG. Altogether, my team consists of eight people, and I'm very pleased that three of them can join us today. We have Andrea Lane, Victoria Tate, and Vanessa Brown. And I'm going to introduce each of them as they speak. So I'm going to begin uh, with Andrea. Andrea Lane teaches Defense Studies at the Canadian Forces College in Toronto. She's completing a PhD dissertation as well at Dalhousie University on the experiences of female combat soldiers in the context of the LZ initiative. She will soon be taking up a position as defense scientist at the DRDC starting in the summer. Congratulations on that, Andrea. So Andrea is gonna talk uh, for about 10 minutes about bridging the divide between feminist and mainstream defense analysis, uh, reflecting both uh, on the work she's doing as part of our team and the, and the network, but also 
um, as a as a young emerging academic uh, in Canadian defense research. Andrea. Okay, thank you. I was not expecting any of that bio, so you may have seen my eyebrows move. Um, so I, I tentatively titled what I'm talking about as gender, comma, expertise, comma, and gender expertise. And what I'd really like to do is do a little bit of a meta deep dive and do a gender analysis of doing gender analyses. So my, uh, my experience is grounded in the Canadian defense and foreign policy community. I work in defense. I, I teach defense. I research and write about defense. So my remarks are primarily focused on that really pointy hard security aspect of of gender and security, uh, talking primarily about what it's like to do defense research when you have sort of a gender aspect to your research. So one thing that I think might become pretty obvious when you talk about who does gender analysis or feminist analysis and defense and who's interested in it is um, just check out the participants in this webinar and see if you can notice anything in particular about who's listening and who's talking. So in particular, if we're thinking about the power dynamic in a room, say at your standard defense conference, when, it, when defense academics get together, um, the people who are talking about gender and defense are like myself, like Vanessa, like Tori, uh, women, junior women, precariously employed and untenured women. There is already a dynamic whenever you start to have conversations around defense and gender, just by who's presenting. And I think, if we think seriously about what it means to be a woman in a primarily male and masculine world, then we're already attuned to the fact that right when we walk in the door, there are people who are discounting what we have to say even before we open our mouths. So they're not particularly interested in hearing feminist analyses of anything, and they're not particularly interested in hearing from a young female academic or a junior female academic, because I'm not really young, but I am junior. And I think it's impossible to separate our experiences of, of doing gender analysis in a larger network of defense analysis from the experience of doing that as junior women academics. And I think it, it colors the way in which we interact with our colleagues. It colors the way in which our expertise is viewed or valued. And I think in some ways it colors the way in which Canadian defense and security as a field continues to kind of, I wouldn't say marginalize, but maybe sideline gender and feminist analyses more generally. And as somebody who comes to sort of feminist defense studies from defense studies via feminism, rather than coming to defense studies from say gender analysis, it's really disheartening because I, having a foot in both worlds means that sometimes people tell me what they're really thinking and they don't understand what they're telling me. So I've heard stuff about, um, uh, oh, the appearance of people making feminist analyses. Like if your gender presentation is not uh, on point, if you look a bit sloppy, if, if, if your male colleagues feel that you are not appropriately femininely dressed or, or done up, uh, I've heard people make remarks like, well, you know, she's clearly a man hater in comfortable shoes. So I don't have to listen to what she says, um, which, you know, it <laughs> is always mind blowing. Um, it's also difficult to react to because in some ways that's valuable information for me to have. If I wish to make an impact in a, in a world in which some of the people in the room that I'm speaking to are having those thoughts, then that actually affects how I might present the information I have. But it also makes me incredibly angry, not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of other women that I work with who are doing really important research uh, in security and defense that is kind of sidelined into like, Ah, uh, well, you know, women are lefties and they come to this by the peace movement and therefore they're not serious defense scholars. Um, I've noticed recently on Twitter, if you are engaged in making um, a more left wing argument about Canadian defense policy, you'd better not be a woman because those two things will be held against you in a way that is, I, I hate to use an, an overused word, but actually kind of toxic. And, you know, in particular, if you're not uh, a young and conventionally attractive woman, if you are making what are sort of critical arguments, not critical in the sense of that's bad, but critical as in sort of coming from the critical academic discipline, you, you are going to be listened to less than a woman who is making um, more conventional or more pro-military or at least military neutral statements. And all of these things kind of intersect in a way that is sort of 
tantamount to proving intersectional analysis. So you can kind of pick a few things. You can be young and conventionally attractive. You can present yourself in a feminine way. You can make a critical argument about the military. Uh, you can do feminist analysis. You can be a junior scholar or you can have tenure. You sort of have to pick which aspects of your identity you're going to uh, bring forward in order to um, have an audience listen to you. That is an immense burden for junior scholars and scholars of gender and feminist analysis to bear that I think our mainstream colleagues and our male colleagues don't necessarily shoulder. I, beyond making me angry, I think we need to consider what you know we as a defense scholarship community more generally are doing when we put a disproportionate burden of knowledge on scholars who do uh, feminist and gender analyses of defense. One thing that I think is a sort of a twin burden that defense scholars who approach things from a critical or a feminist or a gender perspective do is you have to be totally cognizant and caught up on all the literature from feminism and from gender studies, but you also have to do all the conventional defense stuff too, or else you aren't taken seriously. So if I want to make an argument about, uh, and I'm glad that Ambassador O'Neill brought this up. So if I want to tell you how, you know, a feminist analysis of the F-35 starts from the fact that everybody involved in that plane's development and everybody who is earning money from that plane's development and everybody who is in control of the money being spent on that plane is basically a man, then I have to know all the intricacies of the F-35 and the, the history of how we got to the part where we're replacing our fighter, the political history of, of who is, who's involved on each side, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't walk into a room and just tell you my expertise. I have to also know your expertise. And that is, and that is an expectation that is not placed on non-feminist and non-gender scholars. I mean, I can be on a panel with a, a man, for example, who just does procurement. Nobody's asking him, hey, why don't you know anything about gender? But I always get asked, like, why don't you, you know all this stuff about tanks? Well, you know, I study the military as an institution, so I know a little bit about how you use tanks and how that means to you as your identity as an armored officer, but I don't actually know, have to know how the tank works. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's impossible to separate doing gender analysis from the larger pool of what it means to apply a gender lens to the community in which we work. And sometimes um, that means understanding what we're giving up when we encourage gender expertise more broadly, especially the application of GBA plus as a toolbox. So obviously more people doing GBA plus analyses is a good thing. Even that minimum box checking exercise, getting people to think about that is an excellent thing. But from our perspective as experts, what we are in some ways simultaneously doing is saying, hey, you don't have to listen to us anymore. You can do this yourself. And you don't have to pay junior scholars and women to come and tell you how to do this because you can do it yourself. Here's the toolkit. And so I find within myself a tension between saying, everybody should know this, this is fundamental. You, you can't call yourself an expert in defense and security without knowing how to do GBA plus, but also saying like, hold on, you know that turf that you protect by how well you know about tanks? This is my turf. And I don't particularly wanna tell you that you can do this just as well as I can. Um, so I think my time is almost up and that was a little bit of a rant, but I would encourage everyone to think about we're not just applying a gender lens or a GBA plus lens to our own work or helping our colleagues apply it. We should actually be applying a GBA plus lens to the entire academic environment in which we work and practitioner environment as defense and security professionals. Because when you start to peel apart, uh, you know, it's, it's gendered all the way down to use an academic cliche. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, those were very provocative comments and I think a really good reminder that power, of course, operates not just in the world that we study out there, but the very research world and policy world that we are part of. And so the integration of a GBA plus lens is, of course, not just a neutral uh, application of a tool, but, um, you know, takes place within the context of a, of a gender defense culture and, and gendered relations of power within academia and the policy world. Uh, so I think that's really important to keep in mind when we talk about possibilities and limitations for integrating GBA plus more broadly. Um, I will, so if you have any questions, uh, audience members, uh, any questions for Andrea, please uh, put them in the chat. We will um, get to those questions a little later on. I'm going to move on now with the uh, next panelist, which is Victoria Tate. 
Victoria is uh, completing a PhD dissertation at Carlton University on women, peace and security policy and how it has been framed and implemented within the Canadian Armed Forces. She too will be taking up a position as a defense scientist with DRDC this summer. Uh, so there's a trend happening here within our GB Plus team. Congratulations to you as well, Victoria. Uh, Victoria will be talking to us about feminist futures in defense and security, uh, which speaks to uh, some of the, um, the particular interest in foresight analysis uh, as part of our network. Over to you, Victoria. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Maya. Um, so yeah, today I have the real pleasure of talking to everyone about the working paper we're continuing to develop on how to use GBA plus perspectives to enhance or perhaps even transform futures analysis. Um, so first question, probably what is futures analysis? So if you're uninitiated to the topic, I really like Horizon Canada's discussion of it as exploring plausible alternative futures using a variety of different analytical tools um, aimed at understanding existing systems of power and governance and how disruptions inside and outside of that system could disrupt the delivery of essential goods and services. So it could really be anything depending on the topic. It could be the likelihood of a cyber attack uh, threatening our security. It could be climate change, melting sea ice and increasing the likelihood of a great power conflict over newly opened shipping routes. Um, or it could be something even more tangentially related to security, like as AI continues to grow, how are we imagining cyborgs and why are Siri and Alexa women? Why are they gendered female, right? So really what we're aiming to do here is highlight that foresight analysis needs to be informed by an intersectional feminist method if it's to be robust or even effective, to be honest. Um, mainstream futures analysis tends to focus on women as variables. So, um, you know, we talked about sex disaggregated data as sort of as the subjects of study. Feminism in and of itself is ultimately an exercise in imagining alternative, more egalitarian futures and in this way is really an essential lens of analysis. I bounce back and forth a little bit here between GBA plus and feminism because if your feminism isn't intersexual, it's not feminism, right? So um, I mean to say, you know, GBA plus or intersectional feminism. So. One of the things that we really highlight in this paper is that if you are participating in these futures analysis exercises, we sort of consider them what if exercises. Okay, well, you know, what if that ice melts? You're also creating futures while you're doing that work. So by setting the agenda, by allocating resources, um, emphasizing certain kinds of expertise, as we've discussed, um, you're also framing the possible future that could, could eventually occur. So if the majority of our defense and security programs, for example, are designed to prepare for future great power conflict, and we're seeing this more and more, what kind of system are we setting in motion and how are pre-existing interests, either military and political or commercial enterprises, likely to benefit from that system? And what role will they play in preparing us for our future? Um, you can see this difference in, okay, are we preparing for exclusively combat exercises or are we imagining the forces being deployed in non-combat operations, humanitarian interventions, these sorts of things? Um, simply put, because when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So we wanna make sure that our futures uh, analysis is informed by a variety of possible engagements. Um, and I think if we are going to do this, we really have to go back down to the brass tacks of how we understand feminist methods or GBA plus methods. Um, I'm going to borrow a little bit from uh, Maya's work here, but are we examining GBA plus as, you know, um, add women in stir or add racialized people in stir? Or are we actually engaging in gender as an analytical lens or a foundational way to see how systems are constructed? Um, and it's, it's to emphasize that gender is not intended to be something you add on after. It's something that needs to be foundational. So this comes from, you know, Joan Scott, but is it just 
this really superficial women as subjects or maybe superficial analysis of systems of patriarchy, or are we really getting into gender as a constituent of element of social interaction? So that's going to shape both systems and relations within those systems. And I think I, I, I get the sense that we've all experienced this in varying degrees, but I frequently hear from students, from scholars and practitioners in the security field, you know, um, yeah, GBA plus is really important on operations and on operations where counterinsurgency work is involved. So if you consider our work in Afghanistan, there are a lot of those sort of juicy little narratives that you can pull out and talk about how having a female engagement team enhances your ability to liaise with local national women. Um, and it sort of creates the illusion that it's only applicable in certain areas and spaces when it should be again one of the foundational elements of, of what we study so i've actually seen someone say yeah you know gba plus in afghanistan gender perspectives that's all well and good that's not going to help us when we fight the russians well <laughs> yeah it will <laughs> so we need to keep in mind that it's important for all kinds of operations including interstate warfare um, so, Russian disinformation campaigns, for example, heavily rely on gendered narratives in order to um, make NATO forces look illegitimate. Um, and it, it has key implications for the construction and reconstruction of nationalism, right? What does it mean to be an idealized Russian citizen or Canadian citizen? Or So, these are the questions uh, that we need to continue to remain engaged in, even if the particular, I don't know, se security paradigm we're involved in doesn't seem like it requires it. There's always, always a gendered angle. Um, and it, I mean, uh, Wilcox has a piece from 2017 where she brings up drone violence. I mean, to, to most minds, what could be more uh, ungendered or asexual than drones? But I mean, if you look at what drone targeting does, it is inherently a process by which racialized and gendered bodies become killable or manageable. So we need to expand in our futures analysis, uh, different types of domains, information domain, technological domain, not just geographic or cultural, and, um, and ensure that we're taking this from the ground up, not just sort of adding it on after the fact. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's probably <laughs> enough to start an interesting conversation, but this, this is a working paper, so we would very warmly welcome any feedback on directions we might want to take it in or, or other angles we might want to look at. Thank you. Thanks so much, Victoria. Um, so I think what I got from your presentation was something that Jackie also spoke about, sort of the, the GBA plus being integrated too late or only selectively um, depending on, on topic area. Um, and, and, and so that's, that was really an important part of the GBA plus toolkit that our team developed. Yes. Uh, in that it argued that GBA plus needs to be integrated when you're setting your research agenda or when you are defining your research problem. It is really, really crucial to have it integrated right from the start, uh, because otherwise you often don't get to ask GBA plus relevant questions later mm -hmm. on. Uh, so I think that's, that's a really important kind of direction for, for in the future for the better implementation of GBA plus to think about how can we at a systemic level get GBA plus integrated into research questions, both in the civilian defense community, but also within DND CAF uh, research and Global Affairs Canada research. Well, that's, that's mm -hmm. just it. I mean, I think if we're imagining institutions as sort of these value, value neutral coordinative structures, we're not really appreciating the power dynamics that we've each touched on of gender. And so it really needs to be built right into the way you understand your organization and your, your place in that organization. Thank you so much, Tori. And again, a reminder to, um, to put questions for Victoria in the Q&A for later on. And we're gonna move on to our third panelist uh, for today, Vanessa Brown. Vanessa is an assistant professor in the Department of Defense Studies at the Canadian Forces College. Uh, she's also working in the Dallaire Center of Excellence for Peace and Security. 
She too is completing a PhD dissertation at Carlton University in which she brings a feminist analysis to professional military education. Um, and so that is in fact what she's gonna talk to us about today, namely teaching GBA plus to military members and some of the successes and challenges um, that she has encountered in her work uh, as a teacher. Vanessa, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Maya, and it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for joining us online. I can't see your faces, but I, I hope that uh, we're giving you some points to ponder, so I'll offer some more. Um, and I'm joining you from the traditional territory of many nations uh, in Toronto, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, uh, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Wandat peoples. Um, so I'd like to, to bring you into um, my world a little bit. Um, and to do that, um, it's all about the application of gender-based analysis plus um, from a perspective of historical struggle. Um, so Canada's defense policy and international military direction on the implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 commit the Canadian Armed Forces to support the goals of gender equality and the women, peace and security agenda. Work by the military to facilitate these aims is done in part through its application of gender-based analysis plus um, to operations and within institutional policy actions and plans. The government and the military's commitments in these areas has required enhanced training and education uh, on gender and culture for military members. As such, some educators within Canadian military colleges have leveraged these requirements to expand on teaching about intersectionality, in particular, in professional military education. In doing so, two potential issues have been raised. Some educators in the field have suggested that it would be necessary to avoid presenting critical concepts like patriarchy, feminism, racism, and colonialism to military audiences. Others have indicated that presenting intersectional perspectives and analysis tools in absence of considering the theoretical lenses from which they emerged sets practitioners up for failure when implementing them in their work. Together, the concern expressed by some is that military practitioners may be resistant to or not provided with deeper, more critical concepts to understand how to advance gender equality and inclusive security in their work. My experience is teaching senior officers uh, in the Joint Command and Staff Program at Canadian Forces College over the past five years has illuminated a desire by many military students for knowledge and tools that forward social justice domestically and internationally, as well as to enhance cultural inclusion um, for diverse members within the military itself. Specifically, students have been asking for more time in the program to consider security policy plans and actions through critical gender and intersectional perspectives. While our offering of feminist and anti-racist theory within the program has been incremental, common responses from students receiving this education is that they are often considering these ideas for the very first time and that once awoken to systemic and institutional disparities uncovered by applications of intersectionality, they begin to see inequalities everywhere. In this way, the sorts of theoretical and analytical perspectives presented by myself and an active group of military and civilian educators at Canadian Forces College are beginning to set the conditions for military members to acknowledge systems of power like patriarchy, colonialism, heteronormativity, and ableism. This education enables military members to understand their and the military's place within intersectional struggles, to think critically about their role in supporting equality and justice. Um, there are many benefits of intersectional education for military members. Qualitative findings from my PhD research on the integration of gender and cultural perspectives within professional military education show that military leaders who have been exposed to critical race and feminist theories and tools are yielding pro promising and transformative results. Uh, data from my research demonstrates that some graduates with exposure to critical race and feminist theories work to create more inclusive Canadian Armed Forces systems, 
policy and operations by advocating for and applying intersectional frameworks in their daily work. Some leaders with this education have also begun to incorporate intersectional thought into their leadership practices and to disseminate critical thinking about intersectional oppression and disparity more horizontally across the military personal and model approaches. Um, through this education, military students are learning the essential habit to apply intersectionality in the everyday life and work of the military more broadly. And in doing so, military students have created their own collaborative spaces, Zoom chats, in WhatsApp groups, and on the college's internal learning management platform to discuss how ideas about gender, race, ability, and sexuality come to be understood in society and within the military through often taken for granted assumptions of the way things are. Noting that socially constructed ideas about sex, gender, race, ability, and class are subject to change, a growing population of military students are working out for themselves how to be a prominent and enduring part of that change. For example, over the course of the current academic year, students have created an online learning group that contemplates how military identity has been traditionally defined around a view, a very narrow view of masculinity. In these sessions, students have explored alternative ways to define the warrior and military identity, ways that could contribute to institutionally desired culture change. In addition, graduates from years past have created longstanding social media groups, book clubs, and professional development opportunities within their own unit lines to consider and workshop gender equity, anti-racism, diversity, inclusion, and culture change. In these ways, graduates of the Joint Command and Staff Program have been able to apply intersectionality to a range of military responsibilities and tasks, proving that with the right tools and the appropriate delivery methods within professional military education, Military members can be important agents of change, despite the military's complicated relationship to violence, including gendered, sexualized, and racialized forms. Yet, there are two significant challenges to delivering critical feminist and anti-racist concepts in the military learning environment that I'd like to speak to today. The first challenge relates to the introduction of critical concepts for transformative change to a conservative institution founded on customs and tradition. Um, the prospect of naming the patriarchy and racism within a male-dominated and white-centering organization can be daunting. Moreover, it can be difficult to present critical theory in a way that is hopeful and encouraging to military members. Further, it can be a challenge to create a learning environment where military members feel empowered to think critically about their and the military's relationship to gender inequality, racism, heteronormativity, ableism, and classism. But in my experience, presenting these intersecting concepts through honest and open dialogue has emboldened so many military members to become passionate champions for gender equality and intersectionality. Second, as Liddell Hart contends, the only thing harder than getting a new idea into the military mind is to get an old one out. A small contingent of educators have worked diligently, often through adversity, as Andrea spoke to, um, to develop and include curriculum on gender and culture's deep relation to security and insecurity, global governance, leadership practices, institutional policy, organizational change, as well as domestic and international operations. But due to the prioritization of more male stream and traditional military topics, such as war fighting, component capabilities, and largely state-centric state perspectives on international relations, educators are hard pressed to A, suggest the addition of intersecting and intersectional thinkings to conventional conceptions of security, and B, to suggest that traditional topics taught within the program can be valuably examined through an intersectional lens. So instead, educators have often had to fight to carve out space for gender perspectives and intersectionality in curriculum and to represent these as cross-cutting tools of analysis for all institutional and operational work. In confronting these challenges, I have found it useful to start with teaching the basics. Uh, whatever, I'm, whatever content that I'm delivering, I find it helpful to begin with the premise that inequality is developed and maintained at all levels of our social world. 
Inequality can be found at the systemic, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized facets of our social relations. As such, in my teaching practices, I like to position gender inequality and the struggle for intersectional equality more broadly as a challenge for everyone. Importantly, I like to be clear that intersectional inequality is a deep and long standing manifestation of insecurity. So deep and so enduring that most people fail to recognize it, even in moments when they are experiencing situations of intense discrimination, vulnerability and violence themselves. Military professionals also require a clear understanding of the social construction of difference. Social constructions of difference tend to order people into categories that scale from most ideal uh, to least ideal. And these constructions or stories that societies create about difference are culturally specific, unfair, uh, dependent on context, and they also change over time. So while differences are a fact of our social reality, the unfair and unequal meanings and values associated with difference are socially constructed. These social constructions constitute and reproduce inequality. Um, these are the stories that we commonly tell ourselves as a community and as a community, we're responsible to change. Importantly, military members must feel encouraged and must recognize their agency in leading this change. And additionally, military personnel require a good understanding of gender roles and how these roles shift or are amplified in times of social unrest. Importantly, military members need a deep understanding of gender perspectives. So this is the power differential that Jackie was speaking to earlier. They need to know the differential and unequal ways in which particular gender groups of people come to be positioned in situations of vulnerability and insecurity these differing cultural narratives about gender and set the conditions for different sorts of degrees of gender inequality in societies, inequalities that are only, as Jackie mentioned, exacerbated in times of conflict and crisis. Such gendered inequalities can also be transferred and expressed in specific ways in institutions. And for example, long-standing dynamics among gender, power, and authority in the Canadian Armed Forces can be an enabling of mundane issues such as a chilly climate, to extreme inequities across military members, such as sexual harassment and abuse. Moreover, as anti-racist feminist scholar Tammy George argues, military personnel can greatly benefit from a critical look at constructions of gender and race within their own institutions. This requires an understanding about militaries, military members' socialization to the military and the gender idealizations they internalize and promote within the armed forces. Military members can be better, uh, can be better suited to engage with the central tenets of intersectionality by examining the vulnerabilities, risks, and inequalities, as well as exclusions that take place among personnel within the military. This reckoning of military inequities through a positional turn within can assist personnel to better understand their role in the achievement of security commitments domestically and internationally. And lastly, I'd like to speak to the importance of avoiding detrimental narratives about intersectionality. I've noted that academic and military educators have applied a range of justifications for why the military and its members should care about intersectionality. We must be very careful about framing gender perspectives, intersectionality, and tools like GBA plus so closely with operational effectiveness. While diversity, intersectionality, and gender perspectives have many demonstrated operational advantages, these should not constitute the military's primary reason for desiring diverse teams and the use of critical theory. The overarching reason should be to incorporate intersectional thinking so that the military's commitment to inclusive security is realized and that creating an organization where members can be successful while bringing their whole selves to work is a reality. So thank you for enabling me to present uh, to you today. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the responses from the community of, of, uh, of, of practice online. Thanks, Maya. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for offering us some glimpses into uh, what's going on with professional military education, how GBA Plus is, is impacting it. Um, and I would like to follow up afterwards um, with you about this question of how GBA Plus is linked to broader culture change efforts. Um, and 
also this question of, uh, of the need to justify the inclusion of GBAPLAS and, and what might be some other um, some other avenues to, to, to convince people of its importance. Uh, but we will now take a five minute break, uh, just a quick washroom break for everyone and for you to stretch your legs. And uh, we'll meet you back here in five minutes. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A. See you in a few minutes.
Okay, welcome back everyone after this short break. And we're going to start off um, with Ambassador O'Neill. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes just for some, some reactions to the panelists' uh, comments and any, any questions you want to throw out there for them. And after that, we'll go to some of the questions in the Q&A. Jackie? Great idea. I've been, uh, thanks. I've been reading the questions in the Q&A and want answers to them too, so it'll be short. Um, I think you were all great. Thank you so much. I absolutely learned and really appreciated it and wanted to just give it, share a couple of reactions. Um, so Andrew, on your point <laughs> about, um, you know, the, the, even the way that you present or not even the way that you present, uh, has can determine so much about how you're received. And last week I was meeting with a, a group of young ish women trying to work in defense and security sectors. And they were acting for advice. This is in a, in a European country and. You know, I really questioned how I used to prepare for meetings and what of that I even want to pass on. You know, I used to never wear pink when we're meeting with defense folks, or I'd always pull my hair back, or I have minimal. My husband was in the armed forces and I used to use him as like a one man focus group. And he'd always make fun of me if I wore outfits that had like epaulettes on them, you know, and he'd say, oh, excuse me, general, et cetera. And, and I really cared deeply about a lot of it. And then I, so I'd love to be able to say, you know, don't, don't worry about that. Just be yourself, et cetera. But I can't in good faith either, because anyway, so I know how much, uh, how much that matters and how much so many people still have to really process that. And that's a really added burden. And I agree completely with your point about, um, we want everyone to do it, but we also don't want to convey that it's a simple thing to do when it comes to GBA plus. And that's, a real a thing that I think we really need to work on is professionalizing the space and having professionals who do GBA plus. And it's okay to recognize that you the the everybody knowing about GBA plus and being able to do it at a basic level gives us a common language and gives us a common way to interact on it. And that sometimes to do it better, you really need special expertise. And so I I agree with you that I think. Victoria, um, to your point about, you know, it's nice in this aspect of operations, but is it going to help fight the Russians, et cetera? Like, yes, it, it helps with every single thing. And I often share the example about how Canadian forces on the, at, in the NATO mission in Latvia, a big part of the Russian disinformation campaign was saying, you know, Canada allows um, gays and lesbians in its military. It's a, calling it the pink army and they're here to rape our men, et cetera. I mean, that, these were ways that they were trying to discredit NATO forces in the eyes of local communities. And to that point, this speaks a little bit to uh, Veronique's question in, in the chat about how to convince people. I find it very helpful to talk about ways that our adversaries are exploiting gender. So they're not doing GBA plus analyses. They're not using any of the terminology, et cetera, but they're thinking about ways to exploit gender dynamics. And I always, you know, I go on about these all the time, but ISIS one in five foreign fighters who left Europe or North America to join ISIS was a woman. And that was very deliberate recruitment attempts, you know, women recruiting other women with very customized messages. You know, they had often in, in many cases, men from different continents who often didn't even speak the same language come to join ISIS. And they used mass rape against Yazidi women as like the first act of war. So the first act of war that you conducted was on the body literally of a woman to build force cohesion. I mean, these are dynamics that our military colleagues understand that are gendered, but we don't often talk about that. Boko Haram, two thirds of their suicide bombers are women. They do that because they know they're not gonna get searched as checkpoints at the same um, frequency. They can move through markets with less detection, et cetera. Even cyber, you know, they're, again, cyber, we, we talked a little bit about it, but we have, we know that these phishing exercises where you're trying to get information on uh, troop movements and that sort of thing. Most people, most times that there's a phishing exercise uh, on military professionals, someone is pretending to be a woman. So like, what's the gender dynamic here? So I, I like to talk about ways that our adversaries are exploiting gender. And then the last point I'd say too, and I'd love this to be a, a discussion if we can, or this is, I guess, my question relates to this concept of operational effectiveness. And, um, you know, I have this, Real, I, first of all, I, I always try to start with, you know, we need women in security forces because it's women's right 
to prove that they can be in a security force, not because they add A and B and C and they can do these things extra well, et cetera, and try to really permeate that in government is when we're talking about why we have these initiatives, it's not because women can do X, Y, Z, it's because they can do the job and et cetera. And I think the burden always has to be on the institution to justify why we have barriers as opposed to the women as to why they need to be in place. But I'm reluctant to say I'm not going to make operational effectiveness arguments because I think the answer is to redefine operational effectiveness. So I love your take on is that something you think is, is reasonable, feasible, or are you doing it already? But to me, we to give up the concept of diverse forces lead to greater operational effectiveness is sacrificing the definition of operational effectiveness to be a very narrow one versus a force that can engage with and serve the you know, entire populations has an ability to do greater critical thinking, has broader skill sets, et cetera. I'd rather, I'd rather redefine that. So I'd love your thoughts on that, but I know Maya, we want to go to a broader set of questions. So maybe we can work that into some of the responses. And overall, Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> yeah, let's begin with that question because we had at least two participants ask that question. They wanted some more advice on on how to advocate for the inclusion of GBA plus. Um, you know, one of them is working at CAF, another one is working at an international affairs organization and is saying that the focus has been very much traditional security issues and it, it's really hard to even advocate for GBA+. Plus. So uh, maybe I'll just um, go around and see if you have any, any thoughts on that. You know, what, how can you quickly summarize, you know, why does GBA+, plus matter to defense policy? Why is it detrimental to not include a GBA+, plus lens? Um, Victoria. Thanks, Maya. Um, I think that's a great question. And I, I'm uh, almost a little bit incredulous at how often it comes up. I mean, gender happens whether or not you do it. I mean, these are not new processes, right? And they're inextricably linked to nation building, to warfare, to all of these things. And so I would almost liken it to saying like, you know, um, it's like saying you're doing weather. I mean, if a storm is coming, it's coming. It's up to you whether or not you want to be aware of it or not, right? So I think on the note of operational effectiveness, I think it's important because if you look at 1325, a lot of what we're being asked to do is change the way in which operations are conducted. That said, it's not a sufficient justification. So when teaching it, use it to get attention. You know, you could talk to me all day about how that CERN Hadron collector divider thing works, but if I don't have it, like if I don't have that concrete link, I don't care about particle physics, right? So I need something. So definitely use operational efficacy as a, as a hook to get people interested, but then bring up, you know, more convincing justifications of their Canadian citizens. And this is their military too. And, and so you can branch out from from there. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, do you want to add anything? Sure. Uh, and so I think my, my criticism of the operational effectiveness justification as the dominant one that's used is based on critical theory in general. So, um, so uh, the, the historical legacies of the use of the military to control diverse populations and to manage diversity is really central to what we're talking about. And so we, if we take GBA plus perspectives and diversity more broadly as a national property, as something that we own, and then we can deploy at the will of the state, that's not really a pro applying critical theory. And so I think that we have to be very careful about the way in which we use um, operational effectiveness to deploy uh, gender perspectives. So I think that there's a space to redefine operational effectiveness, but I think when we speak to military personnel um, about what operational effectiveness is, there's already implicit associations that, that are very masculinist and um, white centering that are associated with that concept. So I think that we really need to destabilize the concept before we need to do the work beforehand in order to be able to expand the concept um, just like the warrior identity to expand it to new terrain to say, you know what, um, empathy is part of being a warrior, you know, feminine, fem the feminine characteristics that I bring to to the table is part of my identity as a military um, personnel. Um, so, so I think that I think 
we do if we do our due diligence of of destabilizing um, often masculinist um, and ethnocentric visions of what we mean by operational effectiveness, then I'm all for it. Um, but before that happens, I want to be that critical scholar just to, to push the boundaries a little bit more. Andrea, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the operational effectiveness, I, when uh, before our own sexual misconduct scandal broke, the Vanessa Glynn uh, scandal in the US, I was seeing people push back against, you know, operational effectiveness is the reason you should take rape seriously. And I remember tweeting like, I'm so tired of having to justify not raping people because it's bad for like unit cohesion or something. But fundamentally, um, this is about lived experience and this is about the humility of understanding that other people's world worldview is not the same as yours. And so the way that I sort of in, encourage people to think about gender and intersectionality more generally in that sort of operational space is not this will make your operation outcome better. It's that it mitigates risk when and, you know, a, as a military leader, you're all about taking that risk space and shrinking it as much as possible for yourself, for your people and for the mission. And so, um, for example, when the CAF recently got into a lot of trouble doing kind of opposition research on people during the pandemic and, and looking at social media and and they genuinely were not expecting that civilians would freak out about this. It's like, well, if you had maybe run this past a civilian or two, like had a panel of people not in the CAF saying, what does this look like on the outside? You may have not ended up triggering the global mail rule and having this giant scandal on your hands. So part of it is whether you think civilians or women or people with disabilities or, or black people matter in the abstract, their reactions still have an impact on your effectiveness as a military force. So even if you don't like them or you don't care what they think, you still should have some understanding of how your in, your of your in, uh, your actions will be viewed by them. And sometimes that's kind of the doorway or the entry point you need for people to start talking about like, oh yeah, I mean, when so and so speaks, I, I hate the way they talk about this. And you're like, oh, okay. So what what part of it is about your identity? Like, why do you hate Justin Trudeau? Ah, oh, well, I'm from a third generation Alberta ranching family, and my dad hated his dad, and and we have this. And so then you could have a conversation about um, inherited political ideology or regionalism or uh, family ties and all this stuff. And once people sort of take a step back and think, okay, so she's not, she's not telling me that I'm bad because I'm white and have a penis. We're actually having a conversation here. It kind of removes that, that initial resistance and you don't even have to say operational effectiveness. I mean, th the biggest problem with operational effectiveness is that you're guaranteeing an outcome. And frankly, I don't think we have any empirical evidence to suggest that diversity on its own actually does produce better operational effectiveness because operational effectiveness is not a metric that the military measured before we started introducing these diversity measures. So we can't quantify it and therefore I think we should stop promising it. But I can make your risk picture better by having you consider these intersectional identity factors. Great, let's move to another question from the audience, which is how do we measure successful implementation of TBA plus or put another way how do we know that we've had a positive GBA plus implementation like how would you you know it's not just about having done a GBA plus application but but is there a more substantive measure of the successful implementation of GBA plus any reactions from the panelists Thanks, Maya. I think that really echoes something um, that Jackie was saying earlier about expecting these binary outcomes and that that speaks for our toolkit as well. I mean, GBA plus was never designed to be like a, a terminal process where you eventually get to the point where you GBA plus it. Do you know what I mean? So I think there are ways in which you can continue re-asking these questions, evaluating the outcome, start, you know, and, and going from there about how it can be improved. But the degree to which um, your organization or department is engaged in that process, I think is really, really important. Um, and, you know, is it engaged in that process in a meaningful way? Are they allocating budget resources to it? Are they allocating personnel to it, right? Like, 
is your is your WPS group one person. <laughs> so I, I don't think there is any one single metric, but but one would hope that the organization becomes um, more diverse and more inclusive working space and and um, yeah, again, maybe move move a little bit further away from quantitative metrics and start engaged in more qualitative analysis, discussion with personnel, these sorts of things. Yeah, I guess it's important to think about how measurement can go beyond saying, well, we did, you know, 560 GBA plus analyses documents last year to, to, you know, what was the outcome of them? How did they actually uh, change policy? How did they impact um, people in positive ways? So, um, let's see, does anyone else want to chime in? Um, Andrea? Yeah, I mean, part of me wants to say, actually, just asking the questions it, and, and going through the process is kind of a victory. And then another metric would be, um, are you consistently the only person in the room after, say, a year of working together on a team? Are you the only person saying, hey, what about women? Uh, or what about people with disabilities, that kind of thing? Um, but in terms of, you know, in a practical sense, especially in that government space, Many policies are are routine or at least iterated um, several times. So one way that you could point to success using GBA plus analysis would be to say, uh, as Ambassador O'Neill was talking about in, in that flood response. So five years ago, we had a policy on new housing construction in cities, and we did not do uh, a GBA plus analysis when we did that. And in those in those buildings, we currently have a mix of tenants that is say primarily male or primarily able-bodied people. But this time when we were constructing, a, when we had a similar policy in a different city, we used GBA plus analysis and we um, introduced adapt, uh, accessibility features. We moved the elevator. We, we The hallways were better lit because of feedback. And now it turns out that we have a, a better, more balanced mix of tenants in those buildings. So there's sort of two outcomes that you can measure against each other. But I will admit that whenever I hear people asking for metrics for this stuff, it just like the hackles on my back and the neck raise up because you know that classic like not everything that can be measured is important and not everything that is important can be measured. And I think there is some tension when people are asking um, for for results for tangible metrics of of impact. That part of it is well because it, it's because you're do, not doing harm this time around, as whereas without it you are. Mm -hmm. So. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, yeah, so I, I think piggybacking off of what Andrea was speaking to, you know, what we measure is what we make important. And also what we measure usually has resources behind it. Um, so so I think um, one of the, the big challenges is to trying to create um, an enduring and systematic approach to GBA plus uh, applications which is also kind of devalued and feminized and not having, you know, the, the proper resources associated with what we're trying to accomplish. So I think, you know, what we measure is what we make important. And so if you're the person in the room that say, that says, I think this is important, we should, we should measure this, we should input this into our policy planning cycle. And I, I, I it's one of the questions said, um, which which of the government departments are you really proud of in terms of GBA plus? Well, I think Wage is doing an excellent job at creating a policy cycle which incorporates GBA plus from the foundations, and then you know uh, commits to measuring and evaluating and going back and doing it again. Um, and so. Uh, I think that there are, we tend to think about policy as big P policy and like, you know, being really complicated and complex. But the, the thing is, you can apply GBA plus in your daily practices. Um, it doesn't take a bunch of, of resources and money and knowledge. As long as you're having that dialogue, that internal dialogue, the dialogue between your friends, um, the dialogue between your peers, um, to incorporate diverse perspectives, um, to be critical about, about the policies that are in place. Uh, as well as your positionality and how you come to think you know what you know uh, and how that's different from other people. I think that's 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 employing GBA plus in a very personal but a very productive way. And so my PhD research really shows kind of both ends of the spectrum where you can you can uh, approach operational planning processes with the GBA plus framework and create um, inclusive operational planning. Um, you could also do you know how are you how are you creating your meetings at work? 
with your colleagues? Are you including um, their, their various, the various barriers that they might be encountering in the COVID context in an online, um, uh, an online session? So there are a bunch of different ways in which you can apply GBA+, and that's why it's so, so important to understand the levels and depths at which you can apply this from the very systemic level, even to the internalized level. What, what biases am I bringing to the, to the table and how can I challenge those? So I think that's really important to note also. Thank you, Vanessa. I also want to encourage our participants, if you have any responses yourself, you know, in the spirit of, of this being a dialogue and, and, you know, I think we can all learn from each other, but if you have any, any insightful comments on any of the questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A as well and just mark them as not a question, but a response uh, to, to any of these discussion items. I want to move on to another question uh, from the Q&A which is why has there been so little consideration given to the need for GBA plus inclusion within the military healthcare system, considering that, you know, we say that we have a people kind of first approach um, in our defense policy. And I guess this also sort of links to, to another question around how GBA plus is being implemented and how, how much attention we're paying to sex versus gender or whether sex sometimes kind of falls off the table in GBA plus. Um, do any of you have any any thoughts on that? Why has GBA plus maybe not entered into the realm of kind of the military healthcare system in the way that it has been applied to broader policy issues in defense? Maya, I would like to hear from you on this topic. This is really in your area of expertise. So I think your research on women's vet our women veterans in this is really in that space as to why is this being ignored? Well, I think, and you know, the, the person asking this question is someone I work with as, a lot as well, Karen Greek. So both of us, you know, have been pushing this, but I, I do see um, sex often not included in GBA plus. Um, and maybe people sometimes think it's more politically correct not to include sex. It sort of goes back to, to Jackie's comment around gender neutrality and you know this idea that a soldier is a soldier is a soldier and if we just don't pay too much attention to the differences then then we can avoid discrimination but of course in the military context not acknowledging women's very real sex specific um, health issues and needs leads to to discrimination on the basis of sex and gender um, so it's kind of interesting when we think about GBA plus, always to be aware of also what kind of new blind spots, you know, are emerging, right? Whether it's around um, structural factors of intersectionality or kind of on the other extreme end, uh, sex specific issues, right? So um, I'll see if Jackie, Jackie, it, I think you might have something to add as well, or you just, you were just nodding in agreement. No, I just wish, I wish I, understood better why it is not better addressed. And I think your your answer about sometimes maybe it seems almost uh, so offensive it's basic or so basic it's offensive to to surface that people have different actual physical needs. Um, yeah. And again, I think you and Karen uh, should be answering this question uh, much more than I could. Vanessa. Well, I think it's you know, drawing on Andrea's point earlier, you know, the academia, medicine, um, uh, military history, they're, you know, these, these are all, these are all formed around a universal male conception of the world, but also the universal male body. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in various ways, the medical community is still catching up to investigating the differences, um, uh, of, of, uh, um, female experiences with, with health, um, female experiences in the military, um, and, and the level at which, uh, females are injured, uh, the level at which, um, pregnancy, um, uh, can, um, can, can impact your career, uh, progression, as well as the, the time at which you time out, um, in relation to, to males. And, and I think, um, there's a lot of work, really good work that, that is happening around military sexual trauma, 
um, and the, the, the sex and gender um, components of, of, of the, that experience as well. And I think that it's really important uh, to understand the difference between sex and gender. Um, so at the very basis of, of, of what we're trying to describe um, is, you know, how, how is sex constructed in a way that is differentially, differentially valued in our society? But also how are gender roles constructed in a way that is differentially valued in our society? And what is the impact on the healthcare system? And in particular for, um, for those who happen to be most marginalized within the community. Um, so I have a, a former JCSP student uh, who's doing brilliant work in 32, uh, 32 division uh, health services about looking at um, anti-racism uh, approaches to healthcare in the Canadian Armed Forces. And, and this is, this is, you know, such wonderful work um, in, in exploring the ways in which um, social constructions about race, gender, and sex can, can impact a member's career and their, their experience with the healthcare system, not only while they're in um, the Canadian Armed Forces, but when they're tra transitioning out. Um, so I think, I think there's really good work being done, but I think there's certainly much, much more to do. Thanks so much for that, Vanessa. Um, moving on to another question, which was about any resources that you can recommend on TBA Plus, any particular authors, articles, books that really stand out for you? And again, here I invite everyone to um, just throw something into the into the Q&A or the chat box, whatever you prefer. And it also links to another question we got from someone who is um, engaged in writing TBA Plus annexes um, to Treasury Board and Ministerial submissions, and she asks, do you have any suggestions on how to receive additional support to develop our GBA plus annexes? So this speaks really to this question of, you know, what are the resources out there? Um, can you share any great resources that you've come across or that you regularly go back to that you find really helpful? Um, anything you want to share with us? Andrea. So just to address uh, Caroline or Caroline's question, because uh, procurement and gender is sort of my jam, um, the answer is there's not a lot of people writing on it because uh, the topic of procurement has such a giant sort of mountain of stuff that you have to know before you can get into that space and, and even appropriately start to analyze it from a gender perspective or actually any perspective is so vast. Um, I was on an ISA panel that sort of looked at gender and procurement ish stuff a couple of years ago. The, the reality is, is that I don't know of anybody who is doing anything that is specifically about how do you apply GBA plus to procurement. Um, there are people who are in like related spaces writing about, for example, how do you incorporate the gender aspects of the arms trade treaty into arms sales? So that's kind of like a side gambit related to procurement. but. I do find it interesting that, you know, GBA plus is now um, a recommended, but not mandatory aspect of, of um, industry submissions for procurement. And uh, I, I have colleagues in procurement who recently had um, like a workshop around procurement. And I was curious as to what, you know, who was talking about the gender piece and who's writing the gender chapter for the forthcoming volume. And the answer was, ah, uh, no, no one and nobody talked about it. And I think procurement is really actually a good example of one of those spaces that has resisted um, not even feminist analysis, but like any analysis that is other than, you know, should we buy this ship or this plane or is it good or do we need 50 of them or is it 100 better? I mean, it's um, procurement is unfortunately one of those spaces that is uh, almost in totally pro military from in terms of its analysis. Uh, very conventional and very mainstream. And I think that an interesting thing for me is, is for people who are interested in, in getting into, women who are interested in getting into defense, I should note that um, one of the main scholarships for women in defense and security is sponsored by an industry group. And I think that it, it goes back to that conversation of whose ideas are being supported, whose research is being supported. Uh, if you want to be critical in the procurement space, Canada is not a very happy place for you to be a junior researcher. So I'm sorry to not be helpful 
except send me an email and I'll see what I can find you. Uh, yeah, it's really the last frontier in some ways of defense research in Canada. Vanessa. Okay, so one of my other positions is that I'm double hatted within um, the Dallaire Center of Excellence as um, the commander of, of the Defense Academies, as, as the commander of the Defense Academies uh, uh, gender advisor. And part of my role as the gender advisor is to support um, uh, in, in the uh, in doing GBA plus annexes. Um, and so what uh, I've come to uh, realize is the, the dearth of <laughs> disaggregated data from which to create a GBA plus analysis. And so really, um, as, as Jackie was saying earlier, like we need to go back and back and back and back and resource um, that information um, in advance because we're, what we're asking people to do essentially is a is an analysis without any data. Um, so how are we how are we going to um, to shift uh, what what we make important and what we measure is what we make important and how do we resource that? So I think I think for those who are filling out those GBA plus annexes, I feel you because um, a lot of the time the information just isn't isn't there because the the institution hasn't caught up with the questions yet. And I think we really need to do that and we need to do that now. Um, so I, I'd be happy to to help in that in that effort for certain. But um, uh, again, yes, uh, Carolyn, we maybe we can have a, a chat after on on some strategies on, on creating uh, uh, responses uh, to to get the ball rolling on the other end of the spectrum as well. Victoria. Thank you. Yeah, just to bring together um, what Andrea and, and Vanessa are sort of saying, um, there are some areas where you're going to have to kind of blaze your own trail, because I think particularly in the area of procurement, I mean, it is one of those technocratic spaces that is erroneously believed to be gender neutral, right? Like science is gender neutral, is that this is the belief that a lot of people operate with, even though that's not the case. So I think from an academic perspective, you'll have a lot of luck if you look into research uh, on gender mainstreaming in the European Union. There's a lot of really good studies there. Um, particularly, I'm thinking Lombardo and Verlu and their work on how um, senior bureaucrats and, and these sorts of people respond to a gender agenda. And it's interesting because it's not always this direct resistance, you know, it can be just sort of heel dragging or or saying, oh, we do that already. Or, um, and yeah, I think my email is on the site. So, like, if someone wants to reach out, I'd be happy to um, provide a, a a suitable study, but the other couple that I really like are Judith Squires and Sylvia Waldy. If you're looking for how to mainstream in a government organization, um, they provide some really useful frameworks. So that's something to look into. And then once you feel comfortable with that, you really, I mean, we have been doing this in Canada for a long time, um, but with varying degrees of enthusiasm. So some areas uh, are uncharted territory, so you might have to do some heavy lifting, but that's, you know, what the the Defense Security Foresight Group GBA plus team is for, so we're here to help. That's true. We have some resources online, and I think some have been shared uh, in the chat as well. Jackie, I'm curious, do you have any favorite kind of resources that you go back to to kind of refresh the GBA plus uh, analysis? So oh, anything the, that like, you this, is the, this is the whole point about part of why I'm so excited about Canadian, like this is a Canadian national treasure because people want stuff like this and we're doing it. And exactly as you said, we're Kind of blazing our own trails in some in some spaces or ways, or I'm convinced we're doing it sort of more in more places than most others. So that is hard because it's hard to be the leader. But then also, please like share the stuff that you have. I mean, part of what I'm trying to do in my job is we talk about there's not a lot to share with across countries. Like we're not sharing a lot across departments. We're not sharing a lot even between um NGOs or, or civil society organizations that do often really good analyses on projects that they want to do and the government. So there, there are resources and even examples and stuff out there that you know the government of Canada's uh, global affairs department has put out some GBA plus guidance for uh its personnel, et cetera. But we're not 
we have not consolidated this to the extent that we have or that we can and we should share. There's um, one resource I'd site that, I, that I've learned a lot from, and it's a scholar named uh, Jamie Hagen, H-A-G-E-N. She has written something called Queering the WPS Agenda, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. Mm -hmm. And when I first read her article about that about five or six years ago, it really helped me understand how many of the ways that we have evolved as a women, peace, and security group of advocates has been uh, exclusionary to LGBTQ plus people. So that was a really good one. And so querying the WPS agenda is, is something that I've come back mm -hmm. to a few times. We just did an event with her last week um, that I'd say. And while I have the floor, if I can say one quick thing on the um, the impacts of research and this is something I, I get so like ignited by because um, for so long when, uh, you know, when I was in civil society 15 years ago and we were advocating for governments to have national action plans on this and we talk about the importance of having women in peace negotiation, we'd always hear that like, well, what research do we have? What evidence do we have that demonstrates that when women are involved in peace process, X, Y, Z happens? And, you know, the thing I just wanted to scream across the table was like, what inclusive peace processes have we had? So you're you're telling me to document and to give evidence on what a couple of women who were marginally usually included at, at like in a in a um, performative way in some cases raised, or we can give evidence about what women raised in an important way, which was subsequently you know diminished. Like you're looking, you want us to make a case about why a process should be inclusive, and yet we have no sample size of inclusive processes. So I'd always say like, if you give me 50 peace processes that are inclusive from the design phase through, you know, 10 years of implementation and ad adhere to principles of this, et cetera, we'd be happy to study the heck out of that thing. But, you know, when you look at often to the operational effectiveness point, we don't even have a chance to demonstrate it in many ways because we don't have a critical mass of women. So there's lots of reasons why we can't point to that. And, and part of it is we don't have uh, the system that is in place the way we envision it as, as I think feminists to be able to study it. So mm -hmm. get activated by that. One. Yeah. yeah, but I also think we're, uh, you know, we're at a, at a special moment today where like momentum has built up. You know, there's so much more research out there. And, and we also all recognize that this is a sort of collective and ongoing learning effort that yeah. we're all engaged in, right? And one of the questions was about, you know, the importance of creating a community around GBA plus uh, research and implementation. And, and hopefully, you know, we can contribute a little bit to that as part of our GBA plus team, um, but it's an ongoing effort. And I think, you know, as much as we might be the experts, um, we are all still learning as well. So I, I want to make sure. I'll be the first to cite every bit of research everyone just comes up with that I, you know, I do all the time. But oh, we have research that demonstrates that peace processes are 35% more likely to endure at least 15 years where women are meaningfully included. We'll say those. But I, I think, you know, we, we need to be getting research wherever we can. But the idea that we can demonstrate the broad concept of transform something being transformative at the scale that people want is also just not feasible. So agree, mm -hmm. share it and mm -hmm. I'll cite it left and right. And the exciting thing is that we have so many young scholars uh, doing this work these these days, including our three panelists. Um, but Jackie, I'm just looking at the, at the watch here and uh, I wanted to see if you had any other final kind of closing remarks. Anything I've talked too to much, I'm gonna stop. Just to say, please do this because it matters so much and there are, I guarantee you there are people in your in, in institutions that you're working with and around and outside of who are valuing what you're doing and are using it in ways to make a case internally for more and better work even if you don't always see it it's you may face um, resistance in immediate senses but I promise you there is a market and an appetite for what you're doing and we're just building and building that that market uh, so please keep doing this work Thank you, Jackie. And I think uh, Victoria looked like she wanted to say something, but I'll, I'll just give our panelists uh, a final um, opportunity if there's anything you want to add. Hey. Victoria? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so I, um, I 
forgot to give a shout out to the Democratic Control for the Armed Forces. That will likely have some, the DCAF Center will likely have some resources for gender and procurement. Um, and I find gender and security sector reform as search terms are pretty good for, for analyzing those issues in post-conflict societies. You might be able to transport it to, to the Canadian case. So. Andrew? Um, just to pick up on Aaron's point and another one about that, that pushback and burnout. Um, I'm not aware of there being uh, like a, a group of, of people who are, are doing gender within government or within academia, um, but I'm more than happy to set one up or participate in one. So if you know of something like that, um, send me an email. Uh, I know just working with my colleagues within the, the, the gender group of a DSF, it is like a breath of fresh air to be in a virtual room of other women and other people who are who understand the value of gender and feminist scholarship. So if that would be useful to anybody who's sort of working at the margins of government right now, um, I'll put my email in the chat and I would be happy to participate. That's a wonderful idea, uh, Andrea. Vanessa, did you want to make any final comments? Yes, I just wanted to say, you know, you, you've spent the time listening to us talk about why this is so important. And I think it's important for us to spend the time to find out why it's important to ourselves. Um, so part of the stories that we can create is, you know, when did, when was I awoken to these ideas? You know, what's my personal journey? Where can I go from here? And how can I use that in, as part of my, my, my praxis or my leadership um, in, in this area so that I can ensure that this continues in a meaningful um, and enduring way and in a way that will be the most impactful um, for those that are most often pushed to the margins. Um, so I think if we keep, um, if we center those who have been decentered um, historically, um, that's a first good step at learning a lot about mm -hmm. yourself, about your institution, about the systemic realities that we live in, um, in Canadian societies, um, and as a global community. Um, so at every turn, there is a use for GBA+. At every turn, you can do good work. And so you also have us to support you, um, and we are happy, happy to go along that journey with you. So thank you very much for for listening in today, and 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 for and for the, to the panel, and and to Jackie and for, to Maya for sharing your perspectives. I certainly learned a lot, and I've been doing this for for a little bit of time now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for those powerful words and and reminding us that it's a personal journey as well for all of us. And on that note, I, a huge thank you to uh, Jacqueline O'Neill um, and all the all the panelists and all the participants. And I think um, I, I think all our panelists invited you to to get in touch with them as well. So feel free to look up their uh, contact information online on the on the DSFG website. Um, and I hope you can. Uh, join some of the other webinars uh, this week, um, and I hope it was helpful for you. Uh, I sort of see this as um, as an effort to restart some of the GBA Plus uh, work that we've been doing, gain a little bit more momentum. So there will be a survey as well at the end of this week, and we will be in touch with other follow-up activities from the GBA Plus team of the DSFG. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye.